Running background scheduled work for your service is a pretty common task, but it turns out it's not necessarily straightforward to go roll your own system like this. Hi, my name is Nick Cosentino, and I'm a Principal Software Engineering Manager at Microsoft. In this video, I'm going to walk through setting up Quartz.net using SQLite as a backing store so that we can have jobs get scheduled. Now, this video is going to walk us through getting this set up in ASP.NET Core one way, and if you stay to the end of this video, we can see another way how to do this. Keep in mind, this is going to be for SQLite, but you can take the same concepts and go ahead and apply them for other backing stores as well. If that sounds interesting, remember to subscribe to the channel and check out that pinned comment for my courses on Dome Train. With that said, let's jump over to Visual Studio, check out an ASP.NET Core app, and get Quartz set up. Okay, to start things off here, I just have a very simple application. If you look at the very top here, this is a really lightweight, single minimal API app. We're not even going to be using the minimal API itself. This is just to get going to launch our application. I do want to start off with some NuGet packages though. So I'm going to jump over to the project file here. And the ones that I want you to pay attention to are Quartz. So I'm using Quartz 3.11. For this video, we're going to need a Quartz Serialization System Text JSON also at 3.11. This is going to be for later, so you don't need this one for this video currently. And then we're going to need System Data SQLite. And like I mentioned at the beginning of this video, if you don't want to use SQLite as the backing store, that's okay. You can pick a different database. The concepts in this video are going to be the same. It's just that we're going to be using SQLite to keep things simple. Okay, so at the beginning of the application, we are setting up an ASP.NET Core app, and you'll notice I'm not calling run just yet. If we scroll a little bit lower, you can see that I have the app run down here, and you'll notice that there's a bunch of code in the middle here before we call that app.run line. So I'll explain what this is doing, what parts are mandatory, and what parts are just for testing right here. So if we go up a little bit further, we can see that there's this part here that's going to be setting up a scheduler, and this is kind of the core part of what we're looking at in this video. So you can see that I'm using a schedule builder. I'm creating it out of a set of properties, and this is just a name value collection that you can see here. You can basically configure a lot of these properties right off of this sort of fluent builder pattern syntax that we have here as well, but you can also do it with these key value pairs. Quartz allows you to have a configuration file. I'm often not a huge fan of messing around with configuration files to get things going. I like to kind of see how they work in code, and then maybe when it comes time for production, if I want to be able to configure these things, I'll pull that kind of logic back out into a config file. But the config file itself is really just a set of key value pairs, and you can find a lot of these configuration settings on the courts.net website. So this one right here is just going to be setting the table prefix because we are going to be persisting the jobs from courts into a database. The prefix is going to be QRTZ underscore, and those tables, when they get added to our database, we'll use these prefixes. I just have a couple of other settings just to play around with them on here. It's not really going to be applicable for this demonstration here, but just to illustrate that you can use this fluent syntax to configure other things. So if we wanted to, we could go set some other things on here as well. So if we go into this block, use persistent store, this is where we're going to be seeing how we can configure SQLite in particular. So use properties is going to allow us to uh, take these values here. So we'll be able to read in the value of that properties collection. The use system text JSON serializer is coming from that NuGet package that we imported. So there are other serializers that you can use, but I want to use the system JSON serializer. And we can see that on line 240, this is the part that's going to be unique for SQLite in particular. So the string that we're passing in is the connection string. Just for demonstration, I have the database just as quartz.db in the running directory. So I'm not doing anything fancy with my connection string. If you were using, you know, Postgres, MySQL, SQL Server, you might want to load that connection string from a configuration file and then be able to pass it in right to here. And this is so that quartz again has a persistent store. Mine is just going to be SQLite here. Before we move on, this is just a reminder that I do have courses available on Dome Train if you want to level up in your C Sharp programming. If you head over to Dome Train, you can see that I have a course bundle that has my getting started and deep dive courses on C Sharp. Between the two of these, that's 11 hours of programming in the C Sharp language, taking you from absolutely no programming experience to being able to build basic applications. You'll learn everything about variables, loops, a bit of async programming, and object-oriented programming as well. Make sure to check it out.
I do have this uh, set to true for perform schema validation, but I do believe that this setting is true by default. But you can do other configuration here. So you can set retry intervals, all these other things. And you can also see that these are the providers that are sort of built in and provided by default. So Postgres, Oracle, MySQL, Firebird. So yeah, lots of different things in here. And I believe that there's NuGet packages to extend this. So again, concepts that you see here, can be applicable to other data stores. Now, the other thing before we get into some of the code below is that I wanted to call out that with this kind of thing going on here with the quartz tables, the idea is that we're not getting this set up by quartz in the first place. So if we were to just go run this right now, sort of all this logic up until line 250, we're going to have it crash. And the problem is that quartz does not yet have the schema created. It doesn't go and create that schema for you. If you're watching this and you know of a setting that we can go use or a method call to basically go instantiate that for us and set up all of our schema would be great to here. But at the time of recording this, I'm not aware of that. But if you do check out their GitHub for all of the different providers that they have, including SQLite, like this example, I'm going to go expand this block of code here. This is basically the code right from their repository where we can go run the SQL commands to go stand up that schema for ourselves. So I ran it once, kind of like a, an entity framework core migration, right? I just wanted to go run this thing once. Now that my schema is set up for my database, I don't have to go run this code again. You will want to consider this, how this is going to look when you're standing up a database for the first time. But just have a quick look here. I'm just opening a connection and setting the uh, making a new command and then setting the text to be this entire block. It's pretty big but I just pulled this right from their GitHub and then I execute that query right at the end. You don't have to worry about the schema because if, again, if you go to their GitHub for quartz.net, if you go into the databases folder there, you will see that they have all of these uh, SQL commands that you can go run. So don't have to worry too much, but I wanted to call that out because if you just follow this bit of tutorial so far, go run it, you'll say, what the heck's happening? Why is it exploding? That's why you don't have the table set up. So this stuff is a one-time thing and you're gonna to wanna to keep this in place, but then the scheduler start is sort of that next interesting part that's important for us because without starting the scheduler, you won't be able to go run any jobs, which brings us to the next point. If we have a look here, from line 252, I guess technically down to 280, we do want to be able to use this kind of code to test out running a job. What are the pieces of jobs inside of Quartz? Well, jobs are uh, one part and then there's a trigger that's associated with it. So in their architecture and their design, they've sort of broken these things apart. So it doesn't mean that you create a job and as part of the job's definition, it just has a schedule or some sort of timer built into it. You actually define these things separately. And that way you can have a job independent of a trigger that needs to go run it. So it's kind of an interesting pattern, but it can make things a little bit confusing if you're not totally familiar with why these things are separate and the fact that they are separate in the first place. So what we're doing here is building a trigger and you can see that I'm saying this trigger is going to be for a job and a job is defined here by a key. And you'll notice a little bit below, uh, there is this job detail, which I'll get to in just a second, but trigger itself is going to be assigned to this job key. So they're linked together by this. I'm saying that I want to start this trigger five seconds from now, and then I'm going to build this trigger. And then the other part here is just giving it an identity. The first part's a name and the second part is a group. And that's the same thing that we see for this job key. So this is a trigger key and this is a job key, but this part is the name and this part is a group. If you were to go look at the schema in the database, you'll notice that they have columns for these things. So it's just a, a sort of organization for you. Now the job detail is an interesting piece because again, it's going to be assigned an identity that's coming from the job key, right? So the job detail will be linked to the job trigger by this job key. If you look on line 255 and 266, you can see the same job key in both spots. The job builder that's going to create this job detail you'll see that it takes in this type parameter and that says our test job. So if I scroll a little bit lower, you can see that I am defining a I job here, right here called our test job. And the interface method that you need to implement is this execute one that we see on line 289. It takes in this job execution context and then we're able to go run things asynchronously in here. For this example, I'm just going to print hello world to the console, very simple nothing fancy. Now, once we have the job detail and the job trigger set up, you'll notice on line 280 that I'm telling the scheduler, hey, I want to go schedule this job with this trigger. 
A little detail to call out is that usually when we're running asynchronous things, the pattern for naming is to suffix them with async. You'll notice in ports that's not the pattern that they're using. So start is asynchronous, but there is no async on the end. Schedule job is asynchronous. There's no async on the end and execute as well, right? It's a returning a task. This can run asynchronously, but they're not suffixing it. So just something to pay attention to. Visual Studio does a great job of warning you for these types of things. So if you're removing the await, it will say, hey, look, looks like you're about to run a task here. Are you sure that's what you want to do if you're not awaiting it? It will help you catch these types of things, but just pay attention to it because I noticed that a couple of times for myself. At this point, what we have is an ASP.NET Core application, right? That's the very beginning. We are setting up Quartz and we're going to basically hook that up to a SQLite database called QuartzDB in the running directory. We have a couple of parameters that we're setting here, but there's lots of other options that you can play with. We start that scheduler. Now, once that's up and running, and before we start the ASP.NET Core app on line 282, we are going to create this little job that prints hello world to the console. So it looks like this is a lot of work to go set this up, right? But once we have the job defined, we can basically go configure different triggers. This one is just going to fire it off five seconds from now, but I should have called out that there are these other ways to go schedule. So you could basically have um, a cron job set up and set different intervals and things like that, which is super cool. You can do that. This one's just going to trigger it in five seconds. We schedule that on line 280, and then we say to go run the ASP.NET Core app. If you didn't want to use ASP.NET Core, this is an example of how you could go set up all of this stuff for Quartz, right? I could go remove the app.run and all of the stuff with the minimal API. We could just use Quartz as it was set up here, and this would allow us to go schedule things. Let's go ahead and run this example. We should see that after the app starts up, approximately five seconds after, because the app itself has some startup time, we should see that we have Hello World printed to the console. So let's go run it and check it out. Okay, so our app has started up here. And you can see that in the console it printed hello world. So that was probably my bad for hiding the console window behind. If we try again, let me see if I can pull this up in time. Nope. There we go. And hello world gets printed. So you can see I managed to do it quick enough that time to pull the window in front, but we do get hello world written to the console. And that is coming from that Quartz scheduled job. If you were to open up the database while that's happening, you would be able to see that you have a database row get written for the job in the trigger. And then that way, when Quartz is uh, checking the database state, it's able to see that there's a job pending. This is a super quick way that you can get set up with Quartz. Like I said, we did look at this for SQLite, but you can apply this to different storage means. And the way that we configured this was to work with ASP.NET Core, but like I said a little bit earlier, it's not directly coupled to it. We could have run this in a console application as well. So it does not rely on ASP.NET Core. It's just the way that we set this up in this case. Now, I did mention at the beginning of this video that if you wanted to see an alternate way that we could set up Quartz to hang out to the end. So if you want to see how we can set up Quartz specifically inside of ASP.NET Core, you can go ahead and check out this video next. Thanks, and I'll see you next time.